Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station. So happy to have you joining me today. Those of you who are joining us uh, and have watched before, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in again. And for those of you joining for the first time, welcome to our live stream. Uh, so today on Friday, we'll be answering your questions uh, all about space and astronomy and life in general. I give pretty good advice, so, you know, keep things obviously uh, family appropriate. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're gonna be answering your questions today on this Friday live stream. Uh, we do stream on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. Mondays is our What's Up Star Tour, so be sure to tune in at the end of the weekend on Monday night, where I'll be giving you a tour of the night sky and showing you different stars and constellations you'll see this coming week. Wednesdays is our special deep dive live stream. We've looked at topics like the solar system, stellar evolution. Uh, this week we did the best of the Messier catalog of amazing deep space objects. And we've got a fun schedule planned out for you in the future. I'll go ahead and uh, tell you what the next two weeks will be right now. Next week, we'll be taping, taking a deep dive into probes and rovers, learning about all the robotic explorers that humans have sent out into our solar system. So be sure to tune in for that to learn all about what we've sent into space and the exciting things that they've discovered so far. And then the week after that, on May 6th, that Wednesday, will be our live telescope setup and tutorial live stream. So I've been teasing that a little bit, but uh, mark that on your calendars now because that will be our uh, live stream where we're gonna make things a little different and I'm gonna adjust my camera setup here. You'll get to see a little behind the scenes. Uh, and I will show you how to set up a telescope and uh, how to use it. We'll be using a reflecting telescope with an equatorial mount. Um, you're welcome to use whatever telescope, of course, you have in your uh, garage or your attic. Um, and if you want to buy a telescope, you're welcome to. Um, a lot of, there are a lot of different types of telescopes. Uh, so just bear in mind that yours might not match up with ours. But if you do want to buy a telescope um, or if you want to check to see if yours is compatible, once again, I'll be using a reflecting telescope with an equatorial mount. And if you have one or the other of those two, not necessarily both of them, you'll still be able to learn a lot. And if you don't have either of them, you'll still learn a lot about how telescopes work and how they're set up. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Once again, next week will be probes and rovers on the 29th. And then on May 6th will be uh, our live telescope setup and tutorial. So be sure to stay tuned for both of those, our Wednesday live streams. And then Fridays, as we're doing today, is our Fan Friday, where I'll be answering your questions live on the air. Before we start, I just want to give a special shout out and a thank you to our 10,000 loyal Union Station members for their ongoing support during uh, this crazy time we're living in right now. Uh, don't forget that you can help Union Station stand strong by making a gift today. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to Union Station in support of our mission, operations, and volunteers and staff. You can just go to unionstation.org slash donate. Once again, that's unionstation.org slash donate. Find out how you can help us out. Um, and then one last thing, I wanted to give a special shout out uh, to our wonderful uh, volunteers at Union Station, Science City, and at the Planetarium. Thank you so much for everything that you all do. We couldn't do this without you, and especially in this trying time, we all uh, are thinking about how much we miss you all. So once again, thank you so much to our Union Station volunteers. Let's go ahead and jump into fan questions. I'll be watching our live streams on Union Station, Science City, and at the Planetarium. Uh, and some of you are already tuning in. Nancy, thanks for joining us. Uh, Eric, thanks for popping in as well. And uh, we've got Heather tuning in and Betty ready for some science. So thanks for joining us. We had a couple questions uh, earlier in the week. I wanted to address them uh, before we jumped into new questions. So start thinking of those questions, folks, if you're just now tuning in. Once again, we'll be spending today answering your fan questions. So think of something good. Uh, and if it stumps me, then that's even better because I love learning something new. So uh, we did got a question from Kristen last week, uh, and or not last week, I think on Wednesday actually, um, and they were wondering if we could learn about the history of the Milky Way galaxy. So I mentioned the Milky Way a couple times, that's our home galaxy. Uh, we can see this right here. This is Space Engine. We've used this program a couple times so far. This is a one-to-one -one scale simulation of the entire universe, you know, no biggie. Just a couple things to simulate. And this is a simulation of our Milky Way galaxy. This is including all the known stars uh, and nebulas mapped out, as well as other ones that are simulated based on um, what we know about the positions and the distribution of mass in our galaxy. Um, and this is the Milky Way. Now the Milky Way uh, is about uh, 
Well, it's pretty old. It's about as old as the universe. Uh, uh, 12 to 13 billion years old. Um, and it formed, it started forming at the beginning of our universe when everything else was forming, um, when uh, the diffuse masses of gas and dust were floating around, being it slowly influenced by gravity. Now, initially, uh, this gas and dust tended to form stars, and the universe was just full, full of sort of stars and protostars. But over time, gravity pulled those stars together to form groups of stars. Uh, some of these earliest groups are globular clusters, uh, which I mentioned on Wednesday um, during my Best of the Messier catalog. One of my favorite Messier objects is Messier object number 22. That is a globular cluster. So uh, if you missed that live stream, you can watch a recording of that if you want to learn more about globular clusters. But basically, globular clusters are uh, big masses of ancient stars, stars that are about 12, 11 to 12 billion years old that have been around since the beginning of the universe. Uh, and uh, this is these were the first groups of stars, sort of proto galaxies that contained, uh, you know, about a hundred thousand stars or so. But over time, gravity even influenced them and pulled them together. And eventually, these globular clusters got grouped in together to form even bigger masses. Now, over time, as these big sort of proto galaxies were forming, uh, their mass was increasing as all of these different clusters of stars got pulled in. Um, and then, due to angular momentum, eventually these uh, masses of stars started rotating and then started flattening out into this disk shape that we see as uh, most galaxies. Now, our galaxy is a, spi a spiral galaxy, but there are globular galaxies that are just more round-shaped, and those are often the result of uh, gal galactic collisions, so two galaxies colliding. I do talk about that during uh, Wednesday's stream as well. The Andromeda Galaxy is one of my other favorite Messier object. So great question, Christian. Hopefully that kind of answers that about formation of the Milky Way. Uh, Tracy chimed in last time saying hello from Lawrence. I'm so glad uh, that you and your boys love to watch my presentations. It's so great uh, having you all watch. I couldn't do this out without you. And honestly, that uh, talking to you all and answering your questions and seeing you all chime in is really the thing that I enjoy the most about this. So thanks so much for those kind words, Tracy. Um, Tammy asked, what do stars look like inside? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, and I would encourage you to tune into uh, the April 15th live stream, last Wednesday's Deep Dive, where I talked all about stellar evolution and how stars are formed. But to quickly and briefly answer that question, uh, Tammy, stars look like onions. Not exactly like onions, but stars are layered. So um, all stars have different layers. The outer layers are uh, light elements like hydrogen, and then the inner layers are layers where that those light elements are fusing into heavier elements due to the extreme forces and pressures around those stars and all the energy um, being convected inside of them. So uh, our sun, for example, uh, has three main layers. The outer layer is hydrogen. Then there's a layer of hydrogen fusion where hydrogen is turning into helium. And then there's a core of dense helium. Now, when stars get older, that helium starts to fuse heavier elements like carbon, and then the carbon fuses into oxygen. And in massive stars, that might even fuse into heavier elements like neon and silicon and even iron. So you'll get these layers going inwards of all these different densities of gas um, and then layers of fusion. So that's kind of what they look like. Obviously, uh, we wouldn't be able to actually look inside of a star. Stars are millions of degrees in their cores. Um, but that's kind of a way to imagine what they're like. Um, Oh, I did want to briefly mention, too, before we jump into new questions, uh, we had a post on the Planetarium Facebook page. Remember, if you're not liked and subscribed to the Planetarium Facebook page, check that out. That's the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. Uh, give us a like, and we post all sorts of fun space updates there. Uh, but we posted uh, about telescopes, because we'll be doing a live stream about telescopes, and we asked you all to send in uh, pictures of your telescopes, and we had a couple people uh, send in some pictures, so I just wanted to give a shout out to some of those folks who chimed in. This is a picture of Stephanie's daughter, who uh, looks like they've just set up uh, their reflecting telescope there uh, with a motorized mount, looking pretty fancy, so uh, thanks for sending that in, Stephanie. Um, we also had Bobby chiming in with his uh, reflecting telescope there as well. Uh, and then we had Lindy, who was very, very excited uh, to learn about astronomy with that awesome telescope. Uh, so uh, thanks for sending these uh, telescope pictures in. And if you've got a telescope picture you'd like to uh, to chime in with and to, to share, please post it to our Facebook page. We'd love to hear about your telescopes. And again, if you've got a telescope gathering dust in your attic or garage, be sure to take that out, dust it off we'll be learning how to set up telescopes in two weeks during that deep dive live stream. Uh, so thanks for sending those pictures in, guys. All right, let's check our comment streams and see what people are saying. I'm going to start with the planetarium 
uh, stream who's chiming in here. Uh, Eric was asking how I can volunteer to help Science City. That's a great question. Um, so with uh, Union Station closed right now, there's not a lot of opportunities. But if you're interested in volunteering for us uh, when we do reopen, you can head over to unionstation.org. Uh, and I'm going to make sure I get the URL correct. Uh, yep, unionstation.org slash volunteer. And you can find out all about all of our volunteer opportunities, whether it's just at Union Station or Science City. There are a lot of opportunities to volunteer uh, and to help out at Union Station. Uh, so head on over to unionstation.org slash volunteer. Thanks for asking that, Eric. Um, and you can learn all about and get in contact with us now. Why not start talking about that before we do reopen? A lot of fun opportunities uh, to volunteer. So let's continue on here. Oh, and we did post a link to that already on the on the thread I see. Awesome. Uh, all right, on the Union Station stream, we've got a bunch of people checking in. Matthew's chiming in, who's in fifth grade. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm glad you're interested in learning about space. Hello, Cynthia. Cynthia, sorry about that. Um, all right. Got a question from Nancy. Do all stars become black holes? And that's a great question. We answered that in depth during our Stellar Evolution live stream last week, which you can watch that recording if you'd like. Uh, but we're here now, so let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, again, if you want more in-depth explanation with better graphics so that I prepared for that live stream, check out that recording. But in short, there are uh, three main outcomes for a star, uh, and that all depends on how big that star is. Smaller and more average-sized stars, like our sun, uh, when they get old and die, they uh, will become a planetary nebula. So let's uh, go back to, uh, oop, there we go. Go back to Space Engine here, and let me show you a planetary nebula. Uh, let's go over to uh, the Ring Nebula, my favorites. So when average sized stars get old, they will initially expand into a form we call a red giant. Um, but Smaller and average sized stars don't have quite enough mass to fuse heavier elements. So what ends up happening is that after they've fused a couple heavier elements like carbon and oxygen, so they have about sort of four layers, hydrogen, helium, carbon, and oxygen, um, something happens in their chemistry, which I go more in depth in that previous live stream. But long story short, um, they basically don't have enough uh, a gravitational pull to hold themselves together. So they essentially just slowly expand and spread their outer layers back out into space and they leave behind their core, which is a very hot and dense ball of uh, inert carbon and oxygen. And we call that a white dwarf. That's not a star, but that's the leftovers of the core of the dead star. Um, and then we can see in this uh, planetary nebula, uh, the layers of gas that are ex uh, expelled out here. And the different colors are different types of gas. Red is hydrogen and blue is helium. And there are other, some other heavier elements mixed in during other um, rarer fusion events. But um, well, that's essentially uh, what happens to average size stars. We can zoom in and see if we can find uh, the white dwarf here. So this is the center. Now this is a simulation we uh, don't have a, a actual close-up view of this particular white dwarf, but again, we do know that, woo, flew right by. Um, kind of hard to steer this spaceship, so give me a break, guys. Um, we're only traveling 200 times the speed of light right now. Uh, we're going to fly in here. Come on. All right, whoa. So in our simulation, it's actually showing this as a... a multiple star system but but again um this uh is the leftovers of uh this is what our sun will basically look like after it expels its layers in this planetary nebula form um so here is that white dwarf just a very very hot ball of uh, inert gas essentially now what about massive stars though massive stars they are able to fuse heavier elements like neon and silicon and eventually iron. Now, most uh, fusion events, uh, most fusion reactions are exothermic. They create energy. And this creates something we call hydrostatic equilibrium, a balance between the intense gravitational pull of all the mass inside stars crushing inwards and all the energy from those nuclear fusions pushing outwards. That equilibrium keeps a star in balance. Now, there's a problem. When silicon starts fusing into iron, that reaction is endothermic. It absorbs energy. It does not create energy. 
And so in an instant, literally a fraction of a second, that entire equilibrium is broken and that entire star collapses rapidly. Now, two things can happen when this happens. If it's a really big star, but not really, really big, it will collapse inwards. It will shove all of the electrons in the atoms of the core of it, that star into the nuclei of the atoms, leaving only neutrons. And then the rest of the matter will bounce back outwards and explode into a supernova. Um, and supernovas are a little bit messier. Um, we can find a supernova. The Crab Nebula is an example of a supernova. Um, and all of that matter uh, gets thrown outwards. Some extremely heavy elements are created uh, in that brief moment. And then all that's left is a neutron star. So this is a incredibly dense um, ball of, of neutrons, not even gas, just pure neutrons, often rotating at insane speeds. Um, when they rotate that quickly, they uh, become what we call a pulsar. We can actually see that right here. Um, the magnetic field actually sends jets of electromagnetic magnetic radiation out into space. And this rotation is pretty rapid. About uh, This particular uh, neutron star rotates um, 30 times a second. And uh, we can actually measure that from here on Earth. But uh, so again, that's uh, what ends up happening to massive stars. But what about massive, massive, massive stars, gigantic stars? Well, if there's enough mass in a collapsing supernova, then even the neutrons won't be able to stay separated and they get crammed into one another. And basically at that point, our concept of physics breaks down and that thing becomes a black hole. We do know black holes exist. We've mathematically proven them. We've, we've even taken close up pictures of them. Um, but uh, as far as what is inside of a black hole and what really happens, we don't really know. We just know that all the mass of that star is crammed into a point, a single point in space with infinite density, essentially. And that is basically what we understand about how black holes are formed. Now, that's regular black holes. Supermassive black holes, like the one at the center of our galaxy, we're not completely sure where they came from. They could have been created by the merging of multiple black holes, but they're very ancient and have been around since probably the beginning of our universe. So. Um, not 100% sure about those particular black holes. So, um, Nancy, hopefully that answers your question. Not all stars uh, will uh, turn into black holes, only the very massive ones. Uh, Linda, hello. Thanks for tuning in. Adam's asking, do all galaxies expand at the same rate? Ooh, now, that's an interesting question. Um, and answering that question depends on how I, I interpret the question, I suppose. Isn't that true for a lot of things? Um, <laughs> so... Galaxies themselves aren't expanding. Galaxies are relatively stable in their structures, um, and the stars are orbiting in relatively stable positions. Now, um, the, the stability can be broken up during things like galactic collisions, like what's going to happen to the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy in 4 billion years. Uh, tune into our live stream from this Wednesday to learn more about that. Um, but let's talk about expansion in what most astronomers think about, which is the expansion of the universe. Now, we've known for the better part of this century that the universe is expanding. Not the galaxies, but the actual fabric of the universe is expanding. And we know this because um, astronomers have looked at distant galaxies and they found something called redshift. Basically, if you look at light coming from any object, it'll show you a spectrum. And we can match that spectrum with uh, elements that we know of here on Earth. So if we see hydrogen in a distant galaxy, it gives us sort of a cosmic barcode you could think of, and we can match that with cosmic, the cosmic barcode of hydrogen on Earth. But when we look at galaxies really far away, that barcode is kind of shifted over to one side. And the way we explain that is with the Doppler effect, um, which is the same effect that happens when an ambulance passes by you. Passes by you. Um, light waves behave in the same way that sound waves behave, in the sense that uh, in an as an ambulance is traveling towards you, the sound waves are compressed, so the pitch is higher, and it'll sound like dee doo dee doo dee doo. But as the ambulance passes you, those sound waves are now expanded as the ambulance is leaving, and the pitch gets lower. So what happens is when an ambulance passes you, you hear dee doo dee doo dee doo dee doo dee doo dee doo, and it sounds lower. Um, so next time you uh, hear that, you know why that is. Well, light does the exact same thing, and um, when we look at those distant galaxies, we see the light is shifted towards the red spectrum, which means they're traveling away from us. Now, using some very fancy math, we can determine how fast those galaxies are traveling. We can look at galaxies farther away and see that they're traveling at a greater rate. 
And so we learned that the universe is expanding, and it's and it's actually not just expanding, it's accelerating in its expansion. We don't know why it's accelerating. For any uh, expanding uh, thing to accelerate, there needs to be energy fed into that system. That's what we call dark energy. It's not an actual thing, it's just a placeholder for some sort of energy that must exist out there that is causing the universe's expansion to accelerate. So um, to answer your question, Adam, in a very uh, specific and scientific way, the universe specifically is not expanding at the same rate. It is accelerating in its expansion, and we don't exactly know why. All right. Uh, Linda's giving me some emojis that look relatively space related. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on my computer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust that those are those are very clever and spacey. So thanks for sending that in. Um, oh, and Maddie's chiming in about uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, ooh, I actually have the Hubble Space Telescope right here in Lego form, along with uh, one of the Hubble Space Telescope's chief engineers, Nancy Roman. Uh, here is the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope is our greatest eyes on space, in space at least. Um, and uh, yeah, it was launched, uh, well, it was launched 30 days ago, 30 years ago today, yeah, on April 24th uh, in the year 1990. Um, obviously, that was when it was launched, and it took a little while for it to uh, be deployed, and uh, there was actually an error in the mirror, uh, and so it took a couple service missions before it was completely operational. Um, but today was when Hubble left the Earth to go to space, um, and yeah, thanks Hubble. Thanks for uh, being in space for 30 years and sending us some pretty awesome pictures. If you want to see some of those Hubble pictures, check out our uh, the recording of the live stream from Wednesday, because there are a lot of great pictures that Hubble took of those Messier objects. Um, so, yeah, happy birthday, Hubble. Let's check the other uh, streams and see. Uh, Jennifer, thanks. Glad you're finding this thing. Kelly's asking, what is my favorite nebula and why? That's a great question. Uh, and, of course, it's a question I have an answer to. I mean, who doesn't have a favorite nebula? <laughs> um, but let me... Uh, I will go ahead and pull out a little bit of what I worked on for Wednesday's stream because I did mention a few of my favorites during that um, that uh, stream of the Messier objects. Um, and let me go ahead and pull up um, the presentation I made on that too because we've got time, why not? Uh, so in case you guys missed it, we'll talk a little bit more about my favorite nebula. My favorite nebula is uh, the Orion Nebula. Um, just pulling up the imagery I've got of it. Is, all right. So that is uh, a photo that the Hubble Space Tele Telescope took kind of recently, actually. Well, about 10 or so years ago, so not extremely recently, but uh, still, man, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, the Orion Nebula is my personal favorite uh, for a bunch of reasons. It's beautiful, first of all. It, the colors are amazing. Um, just the, the purple and blue and, and a little bit of green mixed in there. And I talked about why uh, part of that is green during my Wednesday stream. Um, kind of fun learning about the different colors of things in space and what they represent. But the Orion Nebula is a, a stellar nursery. It's a, a birthplace of stars. New stars are being formed in here. Um, there are four baby stars at the very center uh, that you can see through a pair of binoculars, actually. Uh, they're called their trapezium, and they're about 300,000 years old, which is uh, very young for a star. Again, stars live for billions of years. And this nebula is visible to the naked eye. It's actually the middle star in the uh, sword hilt of the constellation Orion. If you're looking at the constellation Orion, you've got the belt, and then below it is a smaller line of three dimmer stars. Um, and the middle star is actually the Orion Nebula. And through a... a Decently uh, good starting telescope. Um, you can actually see some of these details. Not these bright colors, but you can actually see uh, the, the structure of this and definitely the trapezium in there. Um, but yeah, Orion is great. Um, that's a close-up picture of the trapezium. And here's some other photos that Hubble took that actually show you uh, a proto um, uh, planetary systems. We call them proplids or protoplanetary disks. Um, so these are solar systems being formed. These stars were just born in the last few thousand years, and then we can see the gas and dust floating around them uh, that will eventually coalesce to form planets. So this is kind of a, a look. These are sort of like baby pictures of solar systems. This is what our solar system looked like four billion years ago. Um, so 
that's one of the that, those are the reasons why Orion is my favorite. We've got a question from Jeff asking, why is our observed universe sometimes displayed as a conical shape? Ooh, very good question, Jeff. Um, and I can actually show you that in Space Engine. So I told you the Space Engine simulates our uh, universe, um, and it, it can simulate parts of our universe that um, have not been observed yet. Uh, just by using uh, mathematics to sort of extrapolate and we call it procedurally generate uh, parts of the sky. Um, and let me see, let me make sure um, I've got it set up correctly in my settings. Um, uh, yes, okay. So if I turn the procedural universe on and we can see uh, quite a few galaxies. So I've zoomed out here and we can see the structure of our universe uh, in a simulated form. But uh, these are procedurally generated. What about just the ones that we have directly observed? Well, if I turn the procedurally generated ones off and I zoom out enough, we actually see um, sort of a cone structure appear here. And it's a little hard to tell in the stream um, and on the software, but you can see these sort of, sort of in one direction. Uh, um, if I zoom around here in 3D, you can see that structure better. So there's sort of patches that are missing basically in our sky surveys. Um, and this is mostly due to how we can observe these distant things in space and what we're limited by. Um, if it's a ground-based telescope that's doing the observations, then you have to think about where it is on uh, planet Earth. And uh, I'm gonna, I'll be right back. I'm going to get a visual aid to help us describe this. Um, this will make Jeff very happy. All right, anybody just tuned in? Sorry, I was just grabbing a visual aid here real quick. Oh, ooh, and with uh, our, here, if anybody wants to see behind the scenes a little bit, we uh, we have upgraded our setup to an actual green screen. So how do you like that? Um, which means the earth is not invisible anymore when I do this. Um, so when talking about how we can observe distant structures in our universe, um, if we are looking at it, at our universe and just the sky and space uh, from a ground-based telescope, then we're gonna be limited by a lot of things. If I had a telescope on in, in the Northern Hemisphere, so like let's say just somewhere on the United States, you can see it there. Well, our range of what we can observe is pretty limited, right? Um, you know, the Earth is gonna be able to spin, a, spin around. Uh, I'm gonna do it this way, there we go. Uh, the Earth is gonna be able to spin around, but we won't be able to see sort of the other side of the globe, right? This, a telescope on, uh, on uh, in North America, won't be able to see sort of down here. <laughs> uh, kind of hard to point it out, but hopefully you're getting the picture here where um, basically a ground-based telescope is gonna be limited in its field of view, we say. And even a telescope in space is gonna be limited by that. When we send a telescope like the Hubble into space, it's gonna have a pretty distinct orientation that um, we don't want to change a lot. If a telescope is pointed in one direction, we send it to space with limited fuel, so we can't constantly move it around and make it look at all sorts of different parts of the sky. Um, so these sky surveys are, are relatively limited, um, and they're limited by human factors too, like you know funding and things like that. So we're still sort of capturing images of uh, the universe, and uh, hopefully eventually we'll get sort of a, a wider view of everything, but um, that's sort of... Uh, how we're limited, but again, we can use math and we can use what we know about physics and what we can observe about parts of the space that we can see um, to extrapolate and kind of predict other structures. It's like, you know how they always say that um, the ocean, we only have observed and measured 10% of the Earth's oceans. Well, we can we can extrapolate the structures of the oceans based on other types of observations and it's the same way for um, these specific sky surveys. So let's jump, that's a great question, Jeff. Thanks for asking that. Let's jump into our comments. Looks like we've got more people tuning in. All right. So much happy to see. I'm glad you joined us today. All right. Looking over. Katie's dropping us some great emojis also. Some really good space emojis. I got to hand it to whoever the emoji people are. <laughs> um, right. On over. Okay. Wow. I think I may have answered all the questions. This could actually be a first. Um, let me write myself a little bit. 
we go. Um, oh, we did get a question, another question from Adam. Uh, what can be seen with an amateur telescope uh, this week or this time of year? Um, so I would definitely encourage you to check into our Monday streams. That's when we dive into uh, the night sky and what you can see uh, this week specifically and this time of year. But since you're asking now, I'll uh, talk a little bit about what you can see. So when we talk about amateur telescopes, um, there's a pretty wide range. You can get into astronomy um, for not a lot of money. Um, for just, uh, I won't put any specific numbers out there, but um, you can... Uh, Astronomy and telescopes specifically are a lot more accessible than a lot of people think. And I'll talk about that more on my live stream in two weeks when I do a telescope setup. Um, but uh, the, the diameter of the tube is really the main factor because the wider the tube, the more light it can take in. Um, so, you know, a four, five, six inch uh, diameter telescope is a great start. Um, and with a telescope of that type of diameter, you'll be able to see the rings of Saturn uh, and maybe even the gaps between them. You'll be able to see the clouds of Jupiter and on a good night, perhaps even the great red spot. Uh, you'll be able to see Saturn and right now Saturn is in a crescent phase. And with a telescope, you'll be able to see that crescent. It'll actually look like the moon through a telescope. Um, and then you'll be able to see nebulas. You'll be able to see the faint outline of the ring nebula. You'll be able to see the structure of the Orion nebula. You'll be able to see globular clusters. You'll be able to see um, some of those larger structures. Uh, so that's what you can see with an amateur uh, telescope. This specific time of year, um, Orion is setting. So if you get out really early, you might be able to still see the Orion Nebula. Um, but uh, later in the evening, we will have the Ring Nebula rising with uh, Lyra. And uh, there are some other uh, galaxies that you can see this time of year. Um, and then really, uh, the main thing that's kind of coming up is that in the summertime, or if you stay up late past midnight tonight or this week, You'll be able to see the Milky Way. Um, now you can see the Milky Way throughout the year because the Milky Way appears to stretch around us. I mean, we're inside of it after all. Um, but uh, depend or based on uh, the Earth's axial tilt and uh, and how that interacts with the time of day and its position around the sun, uh, the Milky Way can be oriented in certain ways that are better or worse for viewing. Basically, what I'm trying to say is right now the Milky Way is almost lined up perfectly with perfectly with the horizon, uh, which means that it's going to be really hard to see because uh, near the horizon, anything in space is that light is passing through more layers of atmosphere to get to us. And that's why things look hazy close to the horizon. And so the Milky Way is hard to see right now. But like I said, if you stay up late past midnight, or if you wait till summertime in the early evening, you'll be able to see the galactic center of the brightest part of the Milky Way will shine super brightly. And it'll be right around the constellation of constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpius. Um, so that's really the coolest thing I would say about the summer skies is just being able to really take in the Milky Way in detail. Um, popping in, check out, uh, I'm gonna refresh my stream here to make sure I've got most recent questions here. Ooh, Nancy's asking, uh, what was or is before the Big Bang? Ooh, now that's, we're getting philosophical. Um, <laughs> we're not really sure. Um, the Big Bang really is uh, just, again, another placeholder theory for um, trying to explain uh, or tr trying to make sense of the fact that if the universe was expanding, then it must have started somewhere, right? It must have started in some sort of form. Um, and there are other pieces of evidence that do support the Big Bang theory, um, but we're not really sure. Some people think that there could have been another universe uh, before this. Some people think that, you know, perhaps this acceleration will stop and eventually the universe will start contracting and it will eventually create another Big Bang. You know, we're not really sure. Um, there are people who will uh, will take uh, things like philosophy and religion to answer those types of questions. Um, but as far as science goes, uh, we're not really sure. And uh, it's kind of hard to see that far back. We can look at very, very, very distant objects, and because light, although traveling very quickly, does take a while to get to us from distant objects, we can see things that were around at the beginning of the universe, but we can't see anything before that because, well, the light hasn't gotten to us yet. Uh, so um, we have a little ways to go before we answer that question. Uh, Maddie's asking, when you said things were expanding, is it moving in one direction or as each individually? That is a great question. and. Really hard to wrap your mind around the universe ex expanding. Um, the way that it was explained to me best was like a balloon. If you if you take a balloon that's not inflated and you draw a picture on it, um, and then uh, 
I've got another visual aid, actually. I'll be right back. All right. Got all the visual aids to get today. Here, hey, a balloon. Oh, maybe not a yellow one. Uh, orange. Yeah, there we go. We can see that. All right, so... Uh, the balloon hopefully will help us to understand a little bit about this. So we can think of the balloon as sort of the universe in its initial state before the Big Bang. Um, and if I draw uh, a face on it with my amazing artistic skills. Oh, wow, this is really great. Um, okay, uh, we're going to give them some hair. All right. Okay, so I've got uh, this little balloon guy here. And this is, uh, so you can imagine this this face as the matter at the beginning of our universe. And as the universe, is ex the universe expands, um, everything moves away from each other. So another sort of way to phrase your question is like, was there a center of the universe? You know, is everything moving away from that um, or things like that? Uh, so, and the question, the answer is no. Everywhere you are in the universe, it seems like you're in the center. So if you are sort of in the eyeball of this guy, it, of the universe, if that makes sense, um, then as the universe, is, is, universe expands, everything's going to appear to expand away from that. So I'm going to do my best to not embarrass myself on the air and inflate this balloon. <laughs> All right, so as we inflate it, you see that relative, so if you are in sort of the nose region of the universe, then the eye eyes region of the universe will appear to be moving away from you, right? But if you're in the eye region of the universe, it looks like the nose region is moving away from you. And that's the universe expanding. Um, oof, so, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, uh, Maddie asked that. Uh, about the universe expanding and uh, so it's not really moving in one direction it's expanding in all directions if that makes sense and again it's not the stuff moving away from each other but it's the very fabric of the universe that's stretching and again we're getting into like very theoretical physics and things that are a little hard to explain with a green screen and uh, a balloon but that's the best I could do Maddie um, Katie's at oh Caleb's asking uh, what Saturn's rings are made out of it's a great question we can answer with technology, let's go back to Saturn. I'm gonna fly into Milky Way. There we go. Here's a great picture. I love this. This this software does a really good job simulating um, things in space, and you can actually find a picture of Saturn, a real photo of Saturn taken by Cassini that looks kind of similar to this. Um, and with the sun shining through the rings of Saturn, we can see that they look kind of transparent. On the other side, though, they are very, very shiny. Now, these rings are composed of mostly water ice. Big chunks of ice that range in size from as big as your hand to as big as your house. Uh, scientists think that these rings were formed when one of Saturn's moons got a little bit too close to the planet and got torn apart by the force of gravity. We can zoom in to uh, these rings and we can actually see that there are some dwarf moons inside of them Ooh, let's pause here um, so this is actually one of Saturn's moons that actually orbits inside of Saturn's rings now our simulation is not amazing it can't uh, really show us extreme details um, but let me see if I can get a picture for you ah yes here we go this, this is cool this uh, is a photo that was taken by uh, Cassini uh, which was the, the probe that orbited Saturn. So that is Daphne's, what we just saw in our simulation. And we can see that it's actually caused sort of ripples in the rings of Saturn. Um, but you can see the sort of the particles in these rings, these sort of frosty chunks. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's an actual photograph of Saturn's rings. Pretty cool. So that is what they're made of, Caleb. All right. Katie is asking about uh, earlier this week when uh, we looked at Venus, uh, it was a crescent shape, or when you guys looked at Venus. Yeah, um, I would love to explain that. So let's zoom. Ooh. Oh, oh gosh. Um, let's go back to the sun. Um, so uh, Venus, 
will appear as a crescent right now when you look at it through a telescope. And only Venus and Mercury will appear in a crescent phase. All the other planets will never appear crescent. And this is because of their positions relative to the Earth. So the Earth is the third planet from the Sun. So any planet farther away from the Sun than we are, like Mars or Jupiter, will always it will, will always be looking at the face of that planet reflecting the light of the Sun. So it will, all, it will always appear close to full. Um, and if that planet was ever in a crescent face, we wouldn't be able to see it because it would be... Uh, you would only be able to see a crescent face if you were at a far enough away angle, which the Earth's orbit does not show. But inner planets like Venus and Mercury, they can appear at an angle. So let me make sure this is the current time. So if we sort of look at our solar system head on, and we look at Venus, or we, we think about Venus's position. So here's us on Earth right here. If we're looking at Venus, it appears like it's close to the sun. It's close to the sun in proximity. That's why Venus always appears either in the early morning or early uh, evening. Um, it'll never appear late at night. Uh, all right, let me just adjust my color here a little bit. Brighter. Starting to disappear. It's cloudy, guys. We're using natural sunlight. Um, all right. So that, that's the best I'll do. All right. Uh, so like I said, uh, Venus is sort of angularly close to the sun. So that means when we're looking at Venus, we are looking at it sort of from the side, and that's why we can see phases. So um, if I go to Venus here from sort of the same angle, we can see. So this is sort of the angle from Earth. Actually, let me fly out far enough. Okay, so if we line ourselves up, so... So this is us on Earth looking at Venus. Whoop. So this is what Venus looks like right now. We're looking at it sort of from this angle. So we see its crescent shape. So that's why Venus and Mercury appear in a crescent, uh, can appear in crescent shape. Um, whoa, whoa. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with being a little fuzzy, guys. Um, and make myself a little brighter, but I'm gonna get a little choppy. Ah, too bright. All right, here we go. It's gonna look a little slideshowy, but that's all right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Katie, about Venus. And uh, okay, it's six forty-five, so I'm just gonna run through and make sure I didn't miss any questions um, because we are getting to the end of our stream. MC is giving me applause. Thanks, appreciate you. Um, Katie's asking about here. Like in the Science City stream, got a couple people joining in. All right, I think I've got most of the questions. Um, and if my guy in the chair will confirm that and make sure I didn't miss anything, that'd be great. Um, but that looks like about it. So last last chance, guys, ask anything uh, while we've I've still got you. Um, but we will start wrapping up this little uh, live stream. Um, all right, let me just confirm. Okay, looks like I got all the questions, guys. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining and to, for tuning in. Uh, these Friday streams are some of my favorites because uh, I get to answer all of your all's questions live on the air. It just feels a little more interactive. Uh, feels a little, uh, little less alone. Me just, you know, being stuck in my green pocket dimension. Um, my entire apartment looks like this, by the way. Uh, so I'm starting to get, uh, you know, well, look, looking for new new uh, n new views so it's always fun to do these streams and get to explore the universe with all of you even though we're kind of trapped in our own little boxes um, but uh, in the meantime while we're all stuck in our boxes thank you so much for spending your Friday evenings and all the other evenings you've tuned in for these streams it means a lot to me it means a lot to Union Station and this is a great way that you all uh, have been supporting us um, and I just want to, you know, give one last shout out and reminder that if you want to find out how else you can support Union Station, Science City, the Planetarium, and all of our programs, just head over to unionstation.org. You can find out more information there um, until we can all see you again under the actual stars at the Planetarium. For now, though, I have been Patrick Hess, your Planetarium Specialist. I hope you all have an awesome weekend, and I hope the skies clear a little bit so you can do a little bit of stargazing. Um, and then I'll definitely see you all starting next week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 6 p.m. for our future live streams. Thanks again for tuning in, y'all. 
Have a great evening.